Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this video is intended for my AP biologist. This is chapter 13 for us, and it's regulation of gene expression, and I'm going to break it up into three videos. All right, so here we go. Let me make myself a little bit smaller. And while I'm doing that and getting ready to present here, remember the notes that my students use are down in the descriptors of this video. And you can have a copy of those as well, as well as a copy of this presentation. And then what my students do is they type in column one, the scaffolding of the notes, and then add pictures to type two. So let's do a real quick overview, a little bit of a review of the different steps. So this is a eukaryotic cell. Here's our nuclear envelope. The process of using the DNA to form RNA, that process is called transcription. When that RNA, remember, it needs to get processed, a cap, a tail, and you cut out uh, the introns and leave the exons, it becomes mature. You go out, get on a ribosome workbench, and the process of tRNAs working with the ribosome and the mRNA to construct a protein, that process is called translation. So if all of our body cells have the exact same DNA, how is it possible for our cells to specialize in different areas of our body? And the key to that is differences in gene expressions, which DNA is turned on and at what time, and which DNA is turned off. So that's what we're going to be studying. And we're gonna start by looking at all the areas where you could have control. So remember, again, this is a eukaryotic control, a eukaryotic cell I'm doing for an overview. So you can control, remember euchromatin and heterochromatin. DNA can be tightly coiled and put away, or it can be available in euchromatin for um, transcription. So whether or not the DNA is available is one point of control. Um, and then if you can do the process of transcription, remember transcription, you have to have RNA polymerase binding to the promoter. So the control of that promoter or whether the RNA polymerase has any assistance to bind to that promoter, that is another point of control. Processing that RNA is a point of control. What gets cut out? Um, for exon recombination, if it can leave the nucleus, um, how long that mRNA lasts or does it get cut up, its ability to bind to the ribosome. And then remember, once you have a string of amino acids due to translation, remember you have your primary structure, which is just the sequence, secondary structure is either an alpha helix or beta pleated sheet. That's just a factor of the amino and carboxyl groups. But the R groups, remember the tertiary structure, the folding pattern imposed upon the secondary, you have chaperone proteins who help put it into the right shape so that it can do its job. Okay, so that's your big picture overview and we'll talk about the details of the control. In this particular video, I'm gonna focus on prokaryotic regulation and in video two, I'll talk about eukaryotic regulation. So if you look down in the descriptor or you have your notes open, 13.1 is prokaryotic regulation and it says operons, right? And so I'm at that introduction right there. Okay, so when you look at prokaryotes, for instance, the prokaryotes that live in your gut, um, gut, then the, that food that's coming to them in their intestines, that's already digested, right, for the most part. Um, but what enzymes they make is all a reaction to what they are exposed to, right? That's how they respond to their environment. So if they don't need a particular enzyme, they won't make it because it's a waste of time and energy. So they will only transcribe and translate the DNA that they need in that moment. Keep in mind in a prokaryotic cell, you don't have the barrier of the nuclear envelope. It's just the nucleoid region. So when transcription takes place, translation can take place immediately after that. So we're gonna look at a few examples, but on your notes, number one, bacteria's environment is always changing. So then are the necessary proteins. So then are the necessary proteins. So the big thing you want to know about in bacteria is what's called the operon. Okay, so the operon is a group of genes and regulatory features that is along the DNA. And it it got named the operon and it's gonna come up and have a lot to do with what's called the operator. Now, let me speak to you just, you are used to in this day and age, you dial directly to somebody's house, somebody's phone, but 
Back in the day, you could call a small town and there would be one line that went into that town and the operator would answer and say, who would you want to talk to? Oh, you want to talk to Mrs. Sloan? And then plug that in and then they would connect it. So the factor of the operator, if the operator was asleep on the job, it's not happening, right? So the operator determined what happened. So that was the analogy in their model when you hear that, okay? So operator has a kind of a different meaning now. So anyway, so if you look right here, here. The operator sits right next to the promoter. If you remember, okay, and this is on your DNA strand, you remember RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, right? And then trans transcription will start. It'll move along the DNA and transcription will actually start when it has um, a codon, right? When it starts, to, when it's initiated for that process to begin transcription. Now, this is the structural genes that let's say this operator is controlling. Farther upstream, that's why there's like a little hash mark right there. Farther upstream in the DNA is another region called the regulator gene. Now, if this regulator gene is transcribed, DNA to mRNA, and translated, it is forming a repressor. Now they're calling it an active repressor, meaning there's nothing you need to do to it. Once it's been made and put in its proper shape, the light is green. It's gonna go and bind on. And what is it gonna do? Well, if it's a repressor, it's gonna repress. So it's gonna go over here and it's gonna bind to the operator. And it's kind of like somebody who's too big for their seat and they kind of spill out into the next seat as well. That's exactly what's happening here. So it's binding to the operator, but it's, affecting RNA polymerase's ability to bind to the promoter. It's blocking it in some way. Now, um, again, we will compare and contrast prokaryotic versus eukaryotic control. So on your notes though, what I want you to do is operon in bacteria, genes are often clustered into units which allow the expression of several related genes to be controlled as a unit. So this operator can control several different genes at the same time. All right, so notice right on there I have the regulator gene and you can see on the notes I have it in brackets. That's because the regulator gene is not part of the operon. That's why it's in brackets, but it influences the operon, okay? So a regulator gene is normally outside of the operon and it codes for a repressor. That's what you want in your notes, codes for a repressor. The promoter is where the RNA polymerase initially binds, is on the promoter. It's kind of like if you want to start zipping up your jacket where the two pieces kind of connect before you can zip, that's what the promoter is like. The operator is a region where an active repressor binds, preventing RNA polymerase from binding to the neighboring promoter. And then these structural genes right here, I gave you all the notes for that. They code for enzymes, proteins that are involved in some sort of metabolic pathway, in some sort of metabolic pathway. Okay, so let's take a look at this, get your bearings, see what you recognize in this picture, okay? So here's a regulatory gene, you know what that's gonna do, and that's outside of the operon. It is coding for some mRNA. If that mRNA is translated on a ribosome, it will form an active repressor. Active repressor is doing what? It's binding to the operator right here, which then affects RNA um, polymerase's ability to bind to the promoter so you cannot transcribe these genes. All right, here is yet another picture because I want to make sure to give you enough. So take in, see if you can get it all here. So here is your promoter, okay? Here is the repressor sitting on the operator, and as a result of the repressor there on your operon, then RNA polymerase cannot bind to the promoter, and therefore it cannot transcribe those genes. Now, if the repressor is moved, and in this case, the repressor was moved because lactose bound to it. And when lactose bound to the repressor, it caused a conformational change in shape of the repressor, so it could no longer bind onto the operator. So when it's gone out of the way, RNA polymerase binds to the promoter and it will start transcribing gene one, two, and three. So here's your mRNA. When that is translated, these proteins right here actually will form an enzyme to digest the lactose. Put a pin in that, I'll come back to it. Okay, I'll come back to it. So take a look right here. 
Okay, we're gonna start now with, we're gonna go the opposite way. This time, we're gonna have a regulator gene that codes for an inactive repressor. So that's different than what we looked at before. So here's your regulator gene transcribed into mRNA. It's not being shown here. That would take RNA polymerase up here, right, on a different promoter, right? And when it is transcribed into mRNA and then translated into a repressor, this time the repressor is inactive. Because the repressor cannot repress, in this case, RNA polymerase has bound to the promoter right here. And as a result, it can go along and transcribe this mRNA, which is translated into different enzymes. And what's interesting about this is those enzymes will work together, those five enzymes, to construct an amino acid that we need to consume, and that is, th that we need to make, sorry, and that is called tryptophan. So tryptophan levels are going to increase the more this gene is transcribed and translated. This is a product, tryptophan is the product. So as that product level increases, it actually acts as a co-repressor. It binds to your inactive repressor and makes it active. Now the repressor is active, RNA polymerase cannot get on the promoter, and this operon is switched off. Now that's not a bad thing. It's not like you're saying, oh darn it, now I can't make any more tryptophan. You don't need any more tryptophan. You have plenty of it, and so it's, hap it's helping facilitate the regulation of this gene. If you have all you need, stop making it, because it's wasting, right? It's wasting time and energy and resources. So this would be an in-product inhibition. It's coming back, activating a repressor, are saying stop making this we have enough all right this one is referred to as the trip operon and this is a repressible operon meaning if it's repressible it doesn't it's its normal state is on and then you can repress it just like something could be edible you haven't eaten it yet but you could right so if it's repressible it's normally on and it gets switched off so on your notes the trip operon, a repressible operon, the operon is on because the repressor is inactive, but it can be inhibited by an active repressor if you activate it, right? So the structural genes, I give you this in the note, code for five enzymes required to synthesize tryptophan. If tryptophan, the product, is present, it acts as a co-repressor, and it will activate the repressor, turning the operon off. So this is very typical in anabolic pathways. Remember, um, in an anabolic pathway is something that builds, right? So this is good. So build it, when I have enough of it, shut it off so I don't build in excess. So this is typical in anabolic pathways, the product activate, activates the repressor. Okay, now the next one, I actually already taught you this one, okay? So let's take a look here. Okay, so this one, and again, this is in prokaryotes. Here, the regulator gene is transcribed and then translated into this active repressor. So he's normally, this operon is off, okay? And so this active repressor is here, okay? It's not like, oh, dang it, you're stopping me. It's because I don't need these genes. But if something shows up where I need them, I need to have a way to switch it on. Well, the deal is these genes right here, if transcribed and then translated, they would form an enzyme that would digest lactose, okay? So now, put a pin in that, and on your notes, you have the lac operon. It is called an inducible operon. You can induce it. It's, it's normally off, but you can switch it on. So this operon on your notes is off. You have an active repressor. Okay, you have an active repressor, but you can inactivate it and you or you can activate the operon, right? If you inactivate the repressor, you're activating the operon. When only lactose is available, okay, put a pin in that. Let me talk to you about the lactose now. Okay. So if lactose is present, now remember, uh, or maybe this is new, um, bacteria's first choice for sugar is glucose. But if there is no glucose, it will go for the lactose, all right? So if lactose is present, lactose will bind to that active repressor 
and inactivate the repressor and pull it off so RNA polymerase can get on the promoter. These particular genes, if transcribed and translated, make an enzyme to digest lactose. So the presence of lactose turns on the genes to get it digested so it can be used by the cell. So that's very elegant, right? So um, on your notes, it says when only lactose is available, this is number two, um, then the structural genes that code for the three enzymes required for lactose metabolism are produced. Lactose binds to the repressor and inactivates the repressor. So the repressor can't repress, or any, repress anymore. Lactose acts as an inducer. So when we call this an inducible operon, lactose is the inducer to that process because its presence is required in order to express a gene. And this is typical of catabolic processes. This makes sense, right? Because your metabolism, there's anabolic building and catabolic, which is breaking. So this is typical of a catabolic process where you need to break something down. That's going to require an enzyme. So the presence of what needs to get broken down is what's inducing the enzymes to um, get made to break that down. All right, now we need to take it a step further. We need to level up a little bit, and that's why it says further control of the lac operon. Okay, E. coli, this is a little meme I made. I don't even know if it qualifies as a meme. There, there is lactose here, but I sure wish I had some glucose, and this bacterium says, me too. Okay, so let's see how that is regulated. We need to talk about cyclic AMP. Now remember, there's ATP, right? And that is adenosine triphosphate. Remember, adenosine is adenine, which is a nitrogenous base. And if you remember, it's a purine, right? Adenine plus ribose. And then you have ATP is three phosphate groups, okay? ADP is only two phosphate groups. AMP is one phosphate group. And it's cyclic AMP. Do you see how the phosphate's binding two places to the ribose instead of one? And you get this when glucose levels are low, okay? So when you don't have a lot of glucose, cyclic AMP goes up, okay? That's a signal, right? Cell signaling, I know that I don't have a lot of glucose. If I'm a bacterium, if I don't have a lot of glucose, cycl I know this also because my cyclic AMP levels rise. All right, so now let's take a look right here. This is referred to as positive control, okay? So let me put a little, uh, and, well, I'll just explain it. Negative control is all about the no, right? A repressor is all about no, because it's stopping, it's getting in the way. Positive control is facilitating. It's like, let's go, let's get this going, all right? So cyclic AMP, what it will do, that's this purple thing right here, the cyclic AMP, it binds to what's called a transcription factor. This is your transcription factor right here, and it activates it. Why is that important? Transcription factor must be a factor in transcription. It helps the transcription factor to bind to the site neighboring the promoter. And basically what it does is it facilitates the process so that the RNA polymerase can more readily bind to the promoter. And sometimes without a transcription factor assisting, RNA polymerase can't bind to the promoter irregardless of the state of the operator. It needs that transcription factor as well. Okay, so on your notes, you have further control of the, of the lac operon. Bacteria prefer to metabolize glucose. Glucose, if there's no glucose available, then cyclic AMP will build up. Cyclic AMP will bind to the cap, and I gave you, I explained what cap is. It is a transcription factor, but it's called a catabolite activator protein, but it's in your notes, activating it, and then it will bind to the DNA, bending it in a way to allow RNA polymerase to more readily bind. This process ensures that lactose is only used, is only metabolized if there is not glucose available. How do you ensure that? Well, because RNA polymerase needs assistance to bind to the promoter, it cannot bind unless you have an active cap. And the only way you can have an active cap 
is if cyclic AMP is available. Why is cyclic AMP available? Because you don't have any glucose. So there are two types of control that you have in your notes, negative control and positive control. Negative control is anything related to a repressor. Remember the repressor gets on the operator and I'm gonna go over that with you again in just one more minute. Repressor, um, anything related to a repressor, active or inactive repressor, when active, it inhibits transcription. And positive control is anything that facilitates transcription. When um, active, it promotes the process of transcription. All right. And then what we can see here, okay, are some different scenarios. Um, and when you look here, it shows you the presence of glucose and the presence of lactose. So plus means it's there, minus means it's not there. So let's first get all of our sites kind of here and let me get a pointer. Okay, so here is the cap binding site that where the transcription factor would bind if there is no glucose, right? Because cyclic AMP is high. Here's the promoter, here's the operator, and here are your genes. In this situation, you have glucose, so therefore you don't have any active cap because glucose is there and you have lactose. Remember, these are enzymes just to make digestion of, um, to digest lactose. So because lactose is present, the repressor is gone, but because glucose is present, you don't have anything to help RNA polymerase bind to the promoter. So therefore the operon is off because cap is not bond on there to facilitate RNA polymerase binding to the promoter. Okay, now let's look in this scenario. We have glucose, so we don't have the cap again, but we don't have lactose, so there's a repressor on the promoter. So operon is off because for two reasons. One, you don't have any lactose to remove the repressor, and two, you must have glucose, so there's nothing to facilitate that process. In this third scenario, you have neither glucose nor lactose, right? So in this case, the cap is good to go. It's got the little green would be the cyclic AMP because there is no glucose, cyclic AMP is up. It has activated the cap, so the cap is trying to help so RNA polymerase can bind, but it can't bind because there isn't any lactose, so the repressor is still there. So how do you really get these in these enzymes? It is a factor of both of these things. No glucose, so your cap is ready to go, and you have lactose, which can remove the repressor, so RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter. All right, so that is the end of part one. We will, I will make another video for part two, eukaryotic regulation. And if um, you're one of my students, I will see you in class.